by pure coincidence, Janet and I both started our careers working lives as exactly the same as journalists. Um, Janet had done over 40 years journalism, uh, spent her time between Cumbria and this part of the world, and she was recently voted as the new, sec new, uh, the new role as the General Secretary of the British Association of Journalists. <laughs> Yes, I'm the new General Secretary of the British Association of Journalists, and that's a union um, that is um, working to help journalists in trouble. So we have a, but we don't do it in the everybody out style. We do it very much by advising them of their legal position and going in and negotiating for them and helping them. We have a team of barristers on hand who assist us. Now I operate from a small office in Fleet Street, which is a place that makes most journalists have a little shiver down the spine, because it's the cradle, it really is the cradle of journalism. Um, when William Caxton died, he'd had his uh, printing press next to Westminster Abbey. Uh, but uh, a guy called Jan de Vinkin, who was actually his uh, apprentice and then did all the printing, bought the printing press and moved it into St Bride's Churchyard, which is just off Fleet Street. And then he opened a shop. And while I was actually um, doing a little bit of research, this, I had a word with the historian at Surprise and I said, uh, where was this shop? Where was the sign of the sun? And he pointed at the building that I occupy and he said, it was around about there. <laughs> uh, so um, really where the newspapers started. And why did this start? William Caxton um, was a bit of a hobbyist and he was independently wealthy, so he didn't need to make any money out of printing. He just wanted to bring books and book learning to Britain. But uh, Jan de Vinkin needed to earn a bob or two. So he moved into the legal district, quite close to St Paul's, where they had the uh, ecclesiastical district. And then he set up his printing press. And you can see it, can't you? This is the medieval period. The Wars of the Roses had just finished. The main spectator sports were jousting and bear baiting. And you can just see some entrepreneur walking in and saying, oh, I've got the Baron of Hornchurch versus the Bastard of East Cheen. <laughs> at Windsor Castle, next Wednesday, entrance fee one groat, but all the people who might want to go and have a groat to spare won't know about it. And Jan de Vinkin saying, well, I, you know, I can print your pamphlet with that on. And, oh, that doesn't take up an awful lot of space. Uh, how about I write the bit about how Lord so-and-so uh, nobly lost his head <coughs> at the Tower of London, and all the people who weren't there will be able to buy this from me and enjoy themselves reading it. And that is exactly how newspapers started, and that's more or less how they work today. Um, the advertisers advertise, and the white space around them gets filled with news. Whether it's good news, bad news, or indifferent, it's filled with news and the general public buy the paper and the advertisers hope that you might actually look at the advert as well as the bit that you really want to hear about. So then I thought, well, has it actually changed? Has this um, has changed since 1491, this profession of ours? Oh, I think I've lost me. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so I, I had a look at some uh, old reporting 
Uh, and this is uh, four different reporters, all talking about the same man, all round about 1500. And it says, one says, he thought of nothing but upon women. That's uh, a guy called uh, Comines. The next one was uh, said, he was licentious in the extreme. Moreover, it was said that he had been most insolent to numerous women after he had seduced them. For as soon as he had satisfied his lust, he abandoned the ladies. The next one, uh, that was uh, Dominic Mancini, uh, who was in England in 1482-83. And then the next one is, he was of youth greatly given to fleshly wantonness for no woman was there whom he set his eye upon, but he would importunately pursue his appetite to have her. And that was Sir Thomas More <laughs> writing about it, I say, and not Sir Thomas More doing it. Um, and then a monk at Croyland Abbey wrote, he indulged his passions too intemperately. Now this is royal correspondence stuff, believe it or not. Um, this was Edward IV. That's the elder brother of Richard III. And uh, nothing's changed, has it? <laughs> that is reporting. That is what happens every time you open your paper and say, oh, did Prince so-and-so do this? No. Yeah, that is how reporting started, because in order to sell something, you have to have something that people want to read about. And quietly, even though we might say, oh, isn't it dreadful? There's nothing but smut in the papers. We're still picking it up. And Robert Burns actually wrote a poem about it because somebody had sent him a newspaper. And he was very disparaging in this poem um, about what he didn't want to read. But as it goes down, and he mentions every a-lister from the reign of George III, you suddenly think, hang on, yes, you really hated this newspaper so much you read it from cover to cover. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, nothing changes. But today, um, newspaper reporters are facing a big threat, and that's one of the reasons why I stood at the age of 62, as General Secretary for the British Association of Journalists. Um, the whole industry is in a threat now because of the internet and declining sales and a different culture that is, the rest of the country is feeling a little bit more than in London at the moment. And because of that, there are things like redundancies happening. And there are people who used to make a very good living and were very respected journalists who are now coming to me and saying, the Daily Mail Online wants to pay me 30 pence a picture for my press pictures. And it's costing more than that in petrol to go and, and go to wherever it was and take that picture. And so they're being squeezed from both sides. But worse than that, the biggest threat is press freedom. Because a lot of people don't actually understand why we have a press. Why do we have a press? Well, it's not just about selling stories about the debaucheries of particular kings, queens, or A-listers. What it is about is informing the public about what is going on in the world. Now, if you go into St. Bride's churchyard where Vivian, uh, Jan de Vinkin, sorry, put his press in uh, 1491, if you actually go inside the church, you'll see something quite special. The very first plaque you see on what, that side is to a young man aged 21 who died in Vietnam not armed with a gun, not there to shoot anybody. He had a notebook, a pen, and a camera. And 
he died telling people what was happening in that war. So the people like you and me could sit at home and read it over the breakfast table. And maybe some get so pet up about it that they would go down to Grosvenor Square and protest and bring an end to that war. And that is why journalism is so important, because it informs people what is going on in the world and allows them to change something. If you go a little bit further down, there are fresh flowers on a little shrine. And that's the people who died more recently in Afghanistan and Iran and Iraq. And right in front of you is the journalists who lost their lives reporting about the, the troubles in Ireland. And it's quite a big shrine because there were quite a few who lost their lives in that struggle, that political struggle. These are the people who went to do that. And these days, people have lost sight of what journalists are really there for. And we're really there to let the general public know what's going on. And so we face struggles everywhere. Struggles to keep our sources safe so that the whistleblowers don't suffer penalties. Um, and difficulties with <coughs> courts, even. Normally, or oh, it used to be understood, that the local reporter went into the courtroom and sat down and wrote down what happened in the courtroom so that everybody else who was doing a, a day's work didn't have to turn up at the court to find out. Nowadays, you'd find, I used to find myself standing on my feet, because you can in a courtroom stand on your feet and wait for a magistrate or a, a judge to acknowledge you and to protest something. And what they used to do is they used to try to prevent you getting the names and addresses of the defendant. Now, it's important to know who the defendant is, because <coughs> Not only should the general public know that somebody's been in court, but also to prevent a miscarriage of justice. Because people might say, oh, hang on, I know he wasn't there. He was in such and such a street when that crime happened, so it couldn't have been him, and come forward. And maybe you can put, put right something that went wrong. But the age is important because we call this the John Smith argument. There could be many John Smiths in a town. There could be two in one household. So it's important to have the address so that the other John Smiths aren't tied with the wrong brush. And it's important to have the age so that you know whether it's John Smith the Elder or John Smith the Younger. And you find it, to find yourself having that argument when it should be already understood is very, very upsetting. And I had a word with a barrister at one point, and I said, look, I said, if you carry this to your ultimate conclusion, this was after we'd had a row about whether one of his witnesses should be anonymous or not. And I said, if you carry this to its ultimate conclusion in England, you would have an unnamed defendant being accused by an unnamed witness going to an unnamed jail where he could unnamed fall down the unnamed stairs and wind up maybe dead. And the barrister said, ah, South Africa. And that's why journalists <coughs> fight for press freedom. Because it, it's for you and you and you and to make sure that you can put things right when they've gone wrong and that everybody's accountable for what happened. So, that is basically one of the reasons why I'm here. The other reason 
is that I got into um, being a union rep in the same way that the BAJA union started. It started rather as a result of a certain uh, newspaper tycoon going belly up in the med with somebody's pension fund. Now at that particular time I was uh, a, a representative of another union, uh, just a local representative, and we'd ha all heard about Mr Maxwell's um, disappearing with the pension fund, and then suddenly somebody came to me and said, uh, our boss has had it away with ours. It's gone. And I said, what do you mean it's gone? He said, we can't find it. This was a trustee of a pension fund saying, we can't find it. And I then led a strike and I called out three unions. I persuaded them to join me and I said, right, we're going out and we're not coming back until we find out what's happened with the pension fund. And faced with not having a newspaper, he at least agreed to talk to us and said that actually he'd been running the company with our pension fund. And we threatened him with the uh, fraud squad and we threatened, threatened him with all sorts of things and the pension fund was restored to us. And then three weeks later I got another call and somebody said, it's gone again. I said, what do you mean he's gone again? He said, no, it's gone again. It's gone. He's, he's, he's got the pension fund money out again. I said, how can he? The, this is going to a, a, an insurance company. Ah, but he had it oh, in a holding account before it went to the insurance company. And he's taking it again. And at that point, I sent him a, an internal memo which said, to lose one pension fund <laughs> might be considered a misfortune. To lose two looks to me like, and I just put three dots. And the following morning, I got a call from the trustee saying, hey, Jan, it's back. We've got it back again. And I said, well, will you follow and track that money until it's in the hands of the insurance company, please? And he did. And so we got our, insurance, uh, our pension fund back. But that just shows you what can happen if you don't have the failsafe of collective bargaining and collective people stamping their feet and saying, this isn't right, we've got to have this. Now the reason that I joined BAJ was that I had to do that on my own because when I rang the other union that I was a member of, and I rang its headquarters in London and I said, somebody's, uh, our boss has got our pension fund and we want it back. The reply was, oh, I'm sorry, I'm the work experience person. Can you ring me back next week? And I said, no, this is a bit more serious than that. Can I have a representative? Oh. I don't know, I'll try. And three days later, I got a phone call saying, well, I'm sorry, if you want to call a strike, well, I can, I can make it in a fortnight, but I'm, I'm sorry, um, I've got more important things to do. And I thought, well, what did I pay you for? What exactly did I pay all those subs for? when I've got to do it myself without any assistance. And I'd had to go down to the Citizens Advice Bureau, like any other citizen, and ask for advice there. I might as well have not bothered paying, so I didn't anymore. And I went to the BAJ. And when you're in trouble with the BAJ, you get a lawyer, and you get me, and you get barristers, and you get anybody else that we need, we think you need, you get tax advisors, you get anything. And when I called them for help, because I didn't need help, I got my general secretary. And my general secretary came all the way from London to Cumbria to go and basically beat up my editor 
about something that was wrong. And that's a different service, isn't it? And that's why I joined this particular union. Uh, I, I don't know, I think, yes, I've been told, yes. <laughs> um, thank you very much for listening to me. Any questions? Well, there's there's two ways of, of looking at this because um, yeah, I I was actually on the train with uh, with a lady who was um, reading pictures about the royal christening, and she was really full of what was you know, and we were talking about the smocking on George's uh, shirt. And we were chatting away about that. And then she shut the thing and she said, you never get anything but bad news, do you? And I thought, what was bad news about that? And the fact is, we don't actually remember the bad news, uh, the good news. We remember the bad news. When something bad happens, it's all hands to the pumps. You know, I've, I've been on quite a, quite a few of these. Uh, and everybody turns up and gets as many words as possible because the daily saying goes up. You know, it, it sounds crazy, but if there's a murder in somebody's neck of the woods, that paper will nearly always sell out. If it's an ordinary event, it'll just have its normal sale and its normal delivery. So if there's something bad happens, then it gets bigger prominence in the paper because people want to read about it. And that's why it tends to end up on the front page, because it's the thing that will make people pick it up. Um, and on really, really, really horrendous days, if you watch how the Evening Standard goes in, in London, they run out of papers, and they run out of papers quite early. And the worse the story, in terms of tragedy, the faster they run out. And that is why there's that emphasis. Yeah. But also, in between that, there will be lots of happy little stories and happy pictures. Um, but you don't necessarily, it doesn't register in the same way. You know, everybody can remember where they were when Kennedy was assassinated, for instance. But can you remember where you were when something very mundane happened. It's, it, you know, it's... Any other questions? Yeah, just a point. It appears to me that, I'm going back now as far as Eddie Shaw, when he came down from Birmingham to London to start his bloody... Well, what can they do? Yeah. Um, that newspapers have gone downhill rapidly reporting that this will be... Which you appear to have done away with proofreaders. Yeah. Um, mistakes are made and they're not checked, obviously, before they come out to print. Yeah. One of the problems, um, and, and I've actually got it on the website, is that they have been getting rid of the professionals and uh, just condensing staff. Uh, I worked at a newspaper where we used to have ten people, plus a couple of proofreaders, actually putting that paper together on a daily basis. And then some, a bright spark came in uh, and went to a symposium in London and told all our bosses, all the proprietors, that you didn't actually need these sub-editor people. <laughs> you just didn't need them. The reporters could put, it, put the headlines on and they could put them in little boxes because that's what, all you needed was a designer. Eh? Uh, and people could put, And they came back and out of that, we went from 10 people down to 5 people doing the same job. But it was worse than that because all those 5 people were entitled to 5 weeks holiday a year. 5 fives, 20, that's 25 weeks of the year when you're down to 4 people. And because they're working longer hours and they're entitled to time off in lieu, then it gets down to 3 people sometimes doing the job that 10 people used to struggle to do with proofreaders as well. And that's why you're noticing more, more literals. 
because they're trying to make people do jobs that they can't do. And that's another of the reasons why I'm a, a general secretary of the union, because they, they push it too far. Time goes on, so I'm going to ask Ray Needham if you'd like to uh, give us a toast to our speakers today. Thank you, Mr. President. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. With newspapers and the press, we take for granted. We've got the news out by newspaper. Some read it, some look through it, as you said. And you, you remember the bad points. But I was interested with the early history of how the news was gathered. And I thought if somebody has got a vivid imagination, you would spread the news far quicker than somebody with uh, just reporting the simple facts. There's a changing face of news distribution with the internet and all the other things that are coming in. It must influence the changing face of journalism and journalism itself. But, and the problems with the internet, you've been, you twitched on, they're not going to go away, are they? They're going to get worse. So, so we, we take newspapers for granted, they're a way of life not just in this country, but throughout the world. And it's, it's, it's interesting that for you to remind us of press freedom, because without press freedom, we are we'll not doing what we should be doing. So fellows, thank you to show your appreciation for our speaker.